This is John for Global Traveler. Today, I have the pleasure of talking travel with Mark DiCarlo, TV host, actor, foodie, travel expert, and winner of three Emmy Awards. How are you, sir? I'm good, John. How are you? I'm great. I, I got winded, you know, explaining all your titles, man. You are, <laughs> you are you've done, the, the thing I love about your career is you've done so many different things, and we're, we're going to touch upon a few of them, and then we're going to talk some travel. Sounds good. One of the cool things you did, you've forever etched yourself into Seinfeld history in the role of Alec Berg. Alec Berg, yes. How did that come to be? And, and uh, tell us, uh, tell us about your experience with that. Oh, uh, I was doing. Uh, I had, I think, uh, I was doing studs at the time here, and I also had my own um, improv group. I had started Second City, uh, had opened a theater out here in Los Angeles. Uh, I forget what year it was, but it was a beautiful theater in Santa Monica. And I was a member of the one of the founding cast members, along with um, Brad Sherwood and Ryan Stiles and Colin Mockery and Andrea Martin and Megan Cavanaugh and Andy Dick and a bunch of really funny people. So uh, they would, you know, casting directors would come and see shows like that all the time. So I got an audition for Seinfeld and I walked into the office and Jerry and Larry were sitting on the couch and I read the scene with them. They didn't give me any direction, which uh, I remember. I'm like, well, is he really pissed that he hmm. didn't get a thank you for these tickets? Does he is he trying to hit on a lane? And they were like, oh, uh, uh, do it. So I did it. I, I remember doing the scene a couple of times and walking out going, that did not go well. And by the time I got back to my car, they had called me and said that I got the part. So I was uh, thrilled and got to be on the show and watched, uh, I've been on a lot of different shows, and that machine was a fantastic machine. It, all the, the main characters, if they weren't in the scene, they were sitting right off camera watching and giving notes and throwing in ideas. It was very collaborative and um, uh, the funniest idea won, which is, you know, why the show was so good. It wasn't an autocracy. It was a, a, a much like Second City. It was a democracy. You know, if you've done nothing else in your career, you cemented yourself well on the Comic Con circuit, just from that role, you could sit, you could have a booth at any Comic Con just from right, that role. right. It's funny. People come up to you all the time and go, "Alec Berg." You but like daily. I'm sure you hear that daily. Uh, if I go out, the last couple of years we haven't been going out a lot, but now everything's back to normal. It uh, is, you know, people it are is. moving around again. So yes. Well, let, let's thrilled. let's take it back a little bit to more of uh, when you started. You're a Chicago guy. How did yes, you start in the industry? Uh, well, I mean, I guess in high school, I started doing plays and doing comedies in high school and started doing uh, stand-up comedy when I was young. And then um, the summer after my freshman year in college, I got a job at Great America. Greatest job ever. I was in the country band there that played in Hometown Square. And we played... Uh, five shows a day, six days a week. Wow. And um, in between songs, I would talk and do comedy and goof around. And it was it was, uh, it was was like um, a finishing school for me as far as performing because we were on stage all summer long. Um, fantastic uh, experience there. I would highly recommend anyone who can, who wants to be a, a musician or a performer or something, um, get a job at an amusement park because the benefits are spectacular. And you get a lot of, stage time which is hard to come by any other way especially if you're a comedian you know you have to go to open mic nights when there's six guys in the audience and those six people are comedians waiting to go on stage so they don't laugh you don't know if your material's any good uh, it was really a great great learning experience and a lot of fun so when did you know that you had what it takes to make a career out of the entertainment industry when i realized i had no other skills john i mean uh, it, it, after the apocalypse, my skill set is not going to be much in demand. Although maybe it will be. People will be depressed because of the apocalypse, yeah. right? Uh, I, so I could I could probably work on an apocalypse set of jokes. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I you know what it was? I, I went to Bennett Academy out in Lyle, and my friend Chris Fay's older siblings, uh, Megan and Jim, were on main stage at Second City. So we were. I don't know how old are you when you're a sophomore in high school. 15. We would, yeah, right. So we're not drinking age. We can't get in. 
But we would go down to uh, Well Street. We'd sneak in the back entrance and sit in the back and watch these people getting paid to be funny. And once I realized that that was an actual job option, I don't think I really ever seriously considered doing anything else. Well, it's paid off for you, obviously. But I've been very lucky. A couple of the ways you've made money outside of all that, you were on some game shows. And, and the funny thing was, I was watching it uh, sometime last year during the pandemic. I was watching Sale of the Century on the Game Show Network. And there you were. Top oh, they re ran on my Game Show Network. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the all time champion on TV Sale of the Century. Uh, I was in college. Yeah. It was the greatest. Uh, it changed my life. I was in college. I was broke, you know, like college students are. And I ended up winning $115,000 in a car and stereos and trips and all kinds of cool things. So I told my parents, um, I had graduated in January from UCLA. This happened in March. I told them, I've got enough money now. I don't have to work. Give me two years to get my show business career started. And if I'm not working in two years, then I'll go get a real job. And uh, luckily... I just started booking commercials and and getting paid to be funny, and I I haven't had a real job since. Well, you you might not have had a real job, but you had many many jobs since. You you've been the voice of Hugh Neutron, which of course opened you up to a whole new generation of, of fans. Uh, I know you're right. like, curb your enthusiasm. I, I could list your whole resume on and on. At some point, you shifted a, or added to, I guess is a better way to put it. You added travel and food to your resume. How did that yeah. come uh, The Travel Channel was looking for a comedian to go around the country and do um, a, a host a show, a food travel show. And um, they reached out to me and they asked you to make a tape, you know, an audition tape. So I made an audition tape because it was they told me it was a food show about travel. So I made an audition tape about me making a delicious recipe for my dog, Groucho. And, and then at the end, I give Groucho a bowl of food and it was a funny little video and they liked it. So they hired me and uh, we did we did 100 episodes of Taste of America, which was another great experience. I, I've been to 400 plus cities in America, um, uh, mom and pop places, places by the side of the road, Route 66 places. Uh, I've eaten uh, Rocky Mountain oysters, clams. You deep fried tarantula up in Seattle, a little bit of everything and really got to know the country. You know, you really you really get to know America and Americans when you're hanging out with them all the time. And it was a it was a great experience. I loved it and um, uh, wrote a book about it called The Fork on the Road, which is on Amazon, which was a bestseller for a while. Uh, it was just a great uh thing and my my dad had worked in the travel business my mom was a travel writer i've always enjoyed traveling so um that show kind of opened me up to <clears throat> the whole world of travel and travel shows and travel expos and travel um you know people are hungry for travel information and uh we started this podcast called the fork on the road myself and my wife yenny alvarez the traveling diva and uh we were doing great until COVID came along and we shut the show down and now we're just starting it up again. We're going to Europe in a couple of weeks to shoot some stuff in, where are we going? We're going to London, Mykonos, Paros and uh, Palermo, Sicily. Nice, nice, nice. So nice that'll nice. be fun. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the last time I talked to you is about maybe six years ago. I met you at a convention and I interviewed you briefly there. Um, I asked you the, the same question, so I'm going to ask it again to see if your answer has changed. Give me okay. your top, top three or four cities in America for um, for food. New Orleans is my number one. Still? Um, still. It's just, there's everything there. You've got, <clears throat> it's a classic port city. One thing I really learned when I was doing the Travel Channel show is, you know, they say necessity is the mother of invention. Food, when you're hungry, you're motivated. And the history of America, the history of the world can be told through the lens of food, right? When the hunter-gatherers sure. ran out of, of, of things to hunt down and kill, they started planting stuff. And then cities started and so on and so on. The food that you get in Atlanta is different than the food that you get in Seattle. And the 
and it's <clears throat> it's very much a product of the people who live there and the the kinds of food that are available in that area. You know, back in the sharecropping days, uh, the sharecroppers had no money, so they made what they called soul food, which was basically all the crappy parts of the animal that the rich people didn't want to eat. You know, chitlins is pig intestine right, yeah. that they cook up and you make it delicious with the Holy Trinity, which is onions, peppers, garlic, a uh, little olive oil. And it, it's a really great way to understand a culture. So wherever, whenever we travel, the first thing we always do in a city is we take a food tour. Um, I, I've given them, I've, we, we always take them when we go places and it, it kind of, you know, um, makes you familiar with the palette of the city. And there's no city that has a more wide ranging palette than New Orleans, because you've got Africans coming through the Caribbean, you've got French, you've got Americans, you've got the American South, you've got uh, people from all over the world, because like New York City or San Francisco, it was a port back in the 1900s. So all those cultures mixing together, really gumbo is the perfect metaphor for New Orleans. So that's my number one. Um, Chicago is probably number two. Uh, I'm biased because I grew up there. Uh, where else? I mean, then it's just regions, you know, the Southeast. I can't go past a Waffle House without wanting to go in. <laughs> I enjoy too. the Waffle <laughs> right? Especially late at night when all the drunk people from the bars come in. Um, San Francisco has good food. L.A., you know, L.A. has pretty decent food, too. Um, so those that's what I would say. I would say New Orleans, Chicago, Miami. New York, uh, L.A., San Francisco. Now, you said you, you take the food tour. So before you go to a city, do you rely on that food tour? Do you do research? How do you determine, or do you just start asking the, the locals, how do you determine where you want to eat in those cities, what places you want to try? Excellent question. When we were doing the Travel Channel show, we would do a thing where we would, we'd finish work about four or five in the afternoon. Then we would walk around. And I would literally stick my head in a door and take a sniff. And if it smelled good, we would eat there. Uh, and if it didn't smell good or aromatic, we would go somewhere else. So the, the nose test was is one good way. Um, that's how we found a place called Sodini's in San Francisco. Really great uh, old Italian place on Green Street up in the uh, North End. Uh, great bar, really good food, fun people. Um uh as far as the food tours go eating if you're going to europe there's a company called eating europe that uh, has never disappointed us they always have great local tour guides and that's if you're looking for a food tour look for a company that has local foodies that are going to physically take you around the city and they'll typically you'll stop at six or eight places and you'll have like a uh in New Orleans, for example, you would you'd go someplace and have a cafe au lait and a beignet. Then you'd go someplace for gumbo and you'd go someplace for alligator and you'd go someplace for fried chicken and maybe some etouffee. Then you'd go to a bar for a, a you know a rum cocktail or a southern cocktail of some kind and then some sort of dessert. In Rome, um, we we did a Vespa food tour, which is awesome. We went all wow. over the city and then the last thing they take you to is a place called Fata Morgana, which is a delicious. Um, uh, gelato place and you really get a feel for if it's a good tour and TripAdvisor is a really good resource read the reviews you know um uh you get a really good feel for the area from the locals and then if you do it on your first day in town now you've kind of got a mental map of the city and the different uh, different neighborhoods and then you can go out and explore on your own um and, and there it's it's We've always found it to be a very good first step when you're going someplace you've never been before, because you don't you don't want to go to the touristy places, right? right. The whole the whole part of traveling is going and meeting the people that live there. You could stay in a six hundred dollar a night hotel, or you can go stay in Trastevere in Rome in an apartment, and you're going to get more Rome out of the apartment, I think, than you will out of a fancy hotel, because in a fancy hotel, it's just everyone kissing your butt all day long. <laughs> Right. Exactly. Actually, I was gonna, the next question I was going to ask, and I think you just answered it to give us your travel tip. But uh, right there. Yeah, it's it's that's a huge um, we always do that. 
uh, this th this upcoming trip, we're doing a food tour in London, which we've already done. Then we're going to Mykonos. And I think we're just going to be on foot in Mykonos because uh, it's a relatively small place. Then we're going to Paros and we're doing food stuff there. Then we're going to Sicily. And on day one in Sicily, we're doing a food tour. And then we're renting some Vespas and we're uh, going to scout out the, um, the area. Well, one interesting thing, at least as far as Europe goes, Every time we go to Europe, we end up losing weight because all you do is you eat delicious, fresh food and walk all day long. And I think that's one of the I mean, when you when you travel, isn't the first thing people ask you when you get back is, you know, where'd you go? What would you eat? Yeah, absolutely. Like in Chicago, that people call me all the time. I'm going to Chicago. Where should I have pizza? And I, my personal favorite is Paisano's. Oh, um, now we're right? talking, my friend. Rudy, Rudy's special at Paisano's. That's oh. the best. It's amazing. Um, but you know, there's Malnati's, there's uh there's uh the Giordano's, there's the Nancy's pizza, the double stuffed pizza. There's all kinds of different varieties, but I think the the character of the city of Chicago comes out in the food. It's big, heavy. If it's 40 below outside, yeah. eat six pieces of this pizza and you're <laughs> gonna be okay. <laughs> you know, I think one of the one of the um misnomers if you will about chicago pizza at least is everyone immediately says deep dish and chicago has so many different styles of pizza and like you said like paisano's is a deep dish uh melani's is deep dish but they also have a fantastic thin crust right well and, and paisano's has a thick and a thin i personally like the the thinner one because you can eat more and <laughs> that's my strategy <laughs> yes. right and and um and just the you know the the I, my wife is a big fan of New York and she likes the greasy New York flippy floppy pizza. I, I'm not into that. I, I like if I'm going to have a thin crust pizza, it's crispy crust with a lot of great stuff piled on top of it. Um, well, I'm going I'm to borrow the old line from the Andy Griffith show when I'm dating myself now. Barney Fife, I just like pizza. <laughs> so I'll, That's I'll, an answer. I just like pizza. <laughs> exactly. So before we, before we uh, end this, Talk to me about the uh, the podcast. Now you're restarting it. Uh, we are. It's called, uh, it's called the Fork on the Road Show. You can go to a Fork on the Road, Fork on the Road dot com, or uh, we're on Apple Podcasts as well. We're gonna. We also do video content, which we put on my Twitter, which is Mark at Mark DeCarlo, and on my Instagram, which is at Mark DeCarlo TV. And our, I mean, we've had. Anyone that touches travel, we've had as a guest on the show. Celebrities, you know, they travel a lot. We had the chief planet hunter for NASA, uh, Sarah um, Yeager, I believe her name was, uh, a Harvard professor who's hunting down planets with the James Webb telescope. Um, travel is, I think, the best education people can have, right? You can read about things in a book, but when you actually go... You, you can't hate someone that you've had a meal with, right? You can disagree with them politically or whatever, but if you sit down and actually have a meal and talk to somebody, you're not, you're not going to hate them. I think it's a great uh, socializing, humanizing thing, eating and, and traveling in that way. So that's kind of what we focus on on the show. We find interesting people. We did a really funny interview with Mormons at the Cafe du Monde in New Orleans because Mormons can't drink Coke or have coffee. And these young kids were coming up to me and, and they were like, what does it taste like? How, is the <laughs> coffee good? I'm like, yeah, here, have a sip. No, <laughs> uh, they were all they were just starting their two-year mission. It was really fun. So you, you, um, we try and approach it with, uh, uh, mirth and comedy and information so that if you want to learn about San Francisco, you go back and you look at one of our episodes from San Francisco and we'll have a tea tour and a food tour and places to go, places to stay away from. And um, we're looking forward to uh, starting it again, uh, e either an audio version or a video version. Uh, we'll see. We're going to go make a bunch of stuff in Europe and then, uh, you know, we're looking for a place to put all of it. Well, one of the things I really liked about the the podcast before was that you know, just like you said, it's it's a little bit of mirth, it's a little bit of information. I actually felt like like I was one of the gang with you, and just kind of spying over your shoulder as you went there, giggling at the jokes, soaking in the information. I thought it was a really nice concept. Um, a lot of 
a lot of cooking shows, a lot of travel shows are dry. And the fact that you combine both and and in an entertaining way, I, I thought created a really nice product. Oh, thanks. Well, and you know what? I mean, that's the that that's the in uh, these again, these are all my opinions, but that's the beauty of traveling, especially if you're traveling alone, which most people don't do. But if you're travel, which but I did, you know, when I was doing my show, we did a hundred episodes, so that was four hundred different cities. Now I was traveling with a crew, but often uh, the crew didn't want to go out at night, and I always did. Uh, so I would go out. Uh, I'm a musician. I play harmonica. I'd go out to bars and meet guys in bands and play with them and go out and and just uh, explore the city on my own. And if you're by yourself, it forces you to talk to people. I had a. I remember. We were in um, uh, 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 North Dakota, Fargo, North Dakota in the winter. It was a billion degrees below zero. There's literally one street <laughs> of downtown. And there was a there was a um, an American Legion Hall and a VFW Hall. VFW Hall was closed on this particular night, but the American Legion was open. So I went in there, sat in the basement. There was a big bar there, sat there and started talking to this older guy. Turns out he was a a fighter pilot in the Korean war and wow. told me inc incredible stories. Uh, he was a Patriot. He was a pilot. He, then he taught guys how to fly planes. And we just sat there, you know, drinking line and Kugel's beer uh, in the wonderful. middle of a, a blizzard. And I got home at two o'clock in the morning. One of the, you know, it was a great night because all right, you, you just don't have those experiences if you're traveling on a, you know, on a bus tour or with a group of people where every moment is planned, you have right. to uh, get out and mix it up with strangers. Talk to strangers. We always say, talk to strangers and travel on your tongue. And if you find, you know, uh, go places where not everybody goes. I mean, be safe, but there's plenty of out of the way, non-touristy places that I think you get... Um, uh, the best flavor of, of wherever you happen to be visiting and, and specifically because they're mom and pop, not touristy places, they're harder to find. I think TripAdvisor has made it a lot easier. Um, there are other websites that do it well, but we, we try and be the podcast version of that. And it's fun when you travel with us. So if we travel with friends or just the two of us or just me alone, it, it should be fun. So we try and bring that to the show and and make it fun and funny and find interesting guests to talk to. We talked to some guy who, um, he was an airplane pilot and he had a four seat Cessna. He flew out of Ohio, flies out of Ohio. And he would take people up to join the Mile High Club. That was his business. And he would get them up there and then he would close the curtains and they would have an hour to fly around and then the curtains would open and then he would land the plane. And and then he would give them, he made little plastic pilot oh, mile funny. high club pins and he would give it to them. And, you know, I would think, I'm like, so who books these mostly guys? And he goes, oh no, it's the wives or the girlfriends who do most of the booking. I'm like, well, you got a good business, my friend. Yeah, I would say he found a nice niche. Right. Before I let you go, you are a Chicago guy. I got to ask you a very, very serious question. Chicago Cubs, is the arrow pointing up, down, or is it level? I don't know. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I want it to be pointing up. Uh, I don't know. You know, in 2014, 15, 16, they were super fun to watch. I'm not thrilled that the old core is gone, but I like some of the new players. I like, you know. Nico Horner, I think, is great, and and Dansby Swanson, strong up the middle. Uh, I, I'll settle for fun to watch at this point. Fun and exciting to watch. I think it's too early to tell. I hope we're buyers at the at the uh, deadline and not sellers again. That would be depressing. I fear. I, I agree with you on all fronts. I fear we might be. I fear we might not do anything much at the the deadline. I fear we might be in a holding pattern. Yeah. Um, here, here's the thing that I think the Cubs figured out a long time ago is that no matter how good or bad the team is, people will always go to Wrigley Field because it's the greatest place on earth. And even more um, so now. Right? Yeah, I think I think 
you know, uh, my friend Kenny Campbell, when they announced that they were going to be renovating the stadium, he started a campaign to move everything to Schaumburg and build a new place. And and uh, that's <clears throat> anyone. If you're going to Chicago for the first time, go in the summer and your trip is not complete unless you spend the day at Wrigley Field. And uh, as you know, John, it's not just the game. It's the day you go early. Yeah. You have breakfast at Murphy's or some of the other little places around there. Uh, go into the park early. If they win, you stay at you know, the bars late and um, have a good time. I was there. I was doing a show and uh, I've been doing a television show in Chicago called Windy City Live uh, the Are last 10 years. Right. Really? <laughs> right. Uh, we, we got canceled in September, but I was there for 10 years. It was awesome. And I was there the night that Kyle Hendricks beat uh, Clayton Kershaw oh. for the win to send the Cubs to the World Series. I was in and Vegas. It, it, uh, it was insane. Yeah. We come out. The, the Clark Street was packed. Sheffield was packed. There was a line of cops down the middle of Clark Street from north of the park to like five blocks south of the park. Not one fight, not one fire. Ha cops were hugging people. Uh, and we had just a fantastic time. And and it, it, Wrigley Field is always, that, that's the architectural, here are my go-tos if you've never been to Chicago before. Architectural tour is fantastic. Uh, Wrigley Field is fantastic. Buddy Guys, uh, Kingston Mines, Ravinia if it's open, Millennium oh. Park if there's a concert there or something. And then just... Uh, you know, Second City, uh, Old Town area. There's so, so many little different pockets of coolness in the city. It's hard to do in just one, one, two or three day trip. You got to keep coming back. That's exactly. You got to keep coming back to Chicago. Mark, listen, man, I, I really appreciate your time. It's it's uh, been a blast talking. I've been a fan of yours, an admirer of your work for years. Um, you're welcome to come back on. Absolutely, when when you, when you get the show going. And we love to, I love to, you know, get an update from you, see what's going on with you. Um, until then, I will absolutely post all the links here and I appreciate your time. Thanks, John. It was great talking to you again. Thanks for reaching out. Thank you, sir. All righty.